who knows what can happen over a 20 minute period and also there are people online who might save this for a later time so the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer what I mean is in the 20 minutes you could easily sin and others may listen later so rebound if necessary if we name our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing when we name our sins to God we're filled with God the Holy Spirit who is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten so with that in mind let us pray Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the Word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have two articles to read to you before we get on with Bible class. The two articles in tandem might be shocking to you. Before I read them, I want you to know that uh, I am in no way one to grab on to conspiracy theories. I do know, however, that living in the devil's world, he does have his own conspiracies. But I'll read the articles, you come to your own conclusion and I only read them because it is prescient in terms of what we're going through today in the cycles of discipline and also the dangers we face as a client nation to God going through each cycle of discipline which we will study in more detail following the reading this is by David Cantonese <clears throat> And this was written on September the 5th, 2013. It comes out of South Carolina. And the title is, Graham's Hawkish, Hawkish Posture Confronts War-Weary Voters in South Carolina. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican, South Carolina, has struggled to pitch the Syrian intervention to town halls back in South Carolina. Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. As one of the leading advocates for bipartisan immigration reform, Senator Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, had already firmly affixed himself to one cause deeply unpopular with conservatives heading into a re-election year. <coughs> it says here that a poll, in a poll, most Americans oppose the military strike in Syria now, as a war-weary weary Congress weighs a military strike in Syria, he finds himself championing another policy that risks antagonizing his base. Graham is on board for launching targeted missile strikes in Syria to diminish its chemical weapon capacity and assist the rebels who have been stuck in a three-year slog with President Bashar Assad that's resulted in more than 100,000 dead. Next to Senator John McCain, there's no more forceful and visible advocate for a muscular response. Graham half jokes about his ubiquitous appearances on the cable networks to call foreign policy, to talk foreign policy, but says he's a highly sought out guest because, quote, I speak with an accent, but without a doubt. <clears throat> Nonetheless, as he seeks a third term in 2014, Graham appears fully cognizant of the risks of his hawkish posture. Quote, My problem is I'm trying to explain to the American people why Syria matters while my commander-in-chief is AWOL, he told a gathering of supporters at a Creekside restaurant Wednesday morning. Quote, But here's the other dilemma I have. I know it matters, at least in my mind it matters. In a 45-minute talk here, Graham guided the crowd through the history, stakes, and consequences of the strife in Syria. 
He spoke plain enough to relate, but detailed enough to showcase his expertise. The argument is a heavy lift. After all, even Republicans, by a 12-point margin, oppose missile strikes, according to this week's Washington Post ABC poll. Graham's primary opponents, a trio of rivals deemed long shots in need of a momentum-shifting event, are eager to seize the moment. Nancy Mace, the first female to graduate from the Citadel, has said intervention would just bolster the opposition that's dominated by Al-Qaeda. Quote, I will stand with the people of South Carolina against Obama's failed leadership and against military action in Syria, she told the Washington Examiner. State Senator Lee Bright, Republican from Spartanburg, known for his inflammatory claims and bombastic bravado, went even further. Quote, John McCain and Lindsey Graham seem willing to go to the ends of the earth to help the Muslim Brotherhood, he zapped. Graham never engaged his foes directly, but his comments to the largely friendly crowd encapsulated the arduous sell to the public. Quote, I don't want another Iraq or Afghanistan war because that's just not what we need to do, he said, before outlining his support for a contained military strike designed to degrade Syria's ability to deliver chemical weapons in the future and assist those who want to overthrow President Bashar Assad. But Graham has heard the counter-arguments. He knows many are skeptical that replacing Assad will install leadership that's any more favorable to the U.S. interest, even in the military-friendly Palmetto State. In fact, a common refrain across the country is that the alternative could be far worse. Quote, Rebel opposition forces are our sworn enemies. We spent billions of dollars in one country trying to wipe them off the planet, Al-Qaeda, and yet we employ the strategy of funding them and giving them weapons in Syria to get Assad, end quote, asked Jesse Graston, who traveled nearly three hours from Rock Hill, South Carolina, and forked over the $12 in order to corner the senator. Facing that strain of skepticism, Graham wound up his case on Syria intervention by raising the stakes considerably. He painted a frightening picture of cascading world events that would reverberate far beyond the borders of a civil war in one Middle Eastern country. If the United States doesn't deal with Syria, Graham promised, Iran would acquire a nuclear weapon by 2014, the King of Jordan would be deposed, and Israel would start preparing to protect itself. Quote, I believe that if we get Syria wrong within six months, and you can quote me on this, Graham said, pausing for dramatic effect, there will be a war between Iran and Israel over their nuclear program. But it wouldn't even end there, Graham surmised. Undoubtedly, he said ominously, the Iranians would share its nuclear technology with U.S. enemies. Quote, my fear is that it won't come to America on top of a missile. It'll come in the belly of a ship in the Charleston Harbor, he said. For Graston, who won't be supporting Graham in the primary, that was a bridge too far. It's absolute fear-mongering, he said in an interview afterward. A professed former avid viewer of Fox News and loyal listener of Rush Limbaugh, Graston said the Enduring conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan awoke him to the grim reality of the Middle East as a perpetual war. He believes the hawks of the Republican Party shredded their credibility with what they promised to deliver in the country's last two foreign entanglements and sees Graham as ignoring the lessons simply for the sake of professing strength. Quote, all the discussion I saw in Congress is based on the proposition or position that Assad has the weapons and did this, Graston said. They haven't sold the case on that. They have not showed me the evidence. If you want this war, show me the evidence. Give me the proof. And they have yet to do that. <clears throat> now, of course, this is by an American newspaper, ABC. And, uh, or ABC affiliated, 
and they always like to put things in political terms. And that's how they put this in political terms related to who's going to come up against Lindsey Graham, etc. Well, there's another article I read concerning this because some things you just have to ask why. Why would someone be so sure as to predict a nuclear holocaust in Charleston, South Carolina, of all places? Why not D.C.? Well, I read the European Union Times. Now, the European Union is no conservative outlet. The European Union is socialist. And the European Union has a different take on it because they're not affiliated in our politics. So they have a tendency when reporting on the United States to simply give facts. Well, let's see what the European Union Times put together. Senator warns South Carolina is a nuclear bomb target following a report on black ops nuke transfer. Senator Lindsey Graham has warned South Carolinians about the threat of a, quote, terrorist nuclear attack, end quote, on the same day our exclusive high-level military intel revealed to us that nuclear warheads were being shipped to South Carolina from a major Texas Air Force base under an off-the-record black ops transfer. Found in the CBS report entitled Graham, Nukes in Hands of Terrorists Could Result in Bomb Coming to Charleston Harbor, the report details Graham's warning that a lack of military action in Syria could result in a nuclear bombing in Charleston, South Carolina, the very destination of the Black Ops nuclear transfer. The CBS report reads, He, Graham, says if there is no U.S. response to Syria, Iran will not believe America's resolve to block Iran from developing nuclear weapons. Graham also says those nuclear weapons in the hands of terrorists could result in a bomb coming to Charleston Harbor. Graham is quite literally saying that if we do not launch a war with Syria, South Carolina may be nuked. And this ultimately reeks of yet another false flag being orchestrated by the United States government in order to send us into war, or at the very least a threat, except this time we're talking about nuclear weapons. Amazingly, we were the first to get intel on this from our credible an extremely high-level military source who told us the following, quote, Dias is beginning to move out nuclear warheads today. I got a tap from Dermo earlier, D-E-R-M-O. This might be military lingo, I don't know. He said it was the first time they have been even acknowledged since being put there in the 1980s. No signature was required for transfer. There was no directive. He said that Dias commander was on site to give authority to release. No one knew where they were going, really, but the truck driver said to take them to South Carolina, and another pickup will take them from there. This was sent to us before the Graham report came out warning about this nuclear attack on South Carolina, and, coincidence exact, and coincides exactly with what Graham is saying. I am deeply concerned by these findings and ask everyone to spread the word on this information immediately. Whether or not Graham is receiving intel from higher ups and believes in a legitimate terror attack on the horizon is unknown, but the reality here is that we have intelligence that has linked the unsigned transfer of nuclear warheads to this exact location. I have another article here. I'll probably save that one for later or tomorrow. I'll let you chew on that one for a moment, but before you think about it, let's get to the Word of God, which is far more important than today's news and could change tomorrow's news if people get with the Word of God. So not only is God the author of human freedom, 
but above all, he is the author of spiritual freedom, which cannot be corrupted by any system devised by man or devised by the machinations of Satan's system, Cosmos Diabolicus. Now in eschatology, there are four great judgments that are to come. Eschatology prophesies future events. Eschatology is a theological term. The four great judgments in history will produce maximum values shortly after the judgment is executed. Judgment during the church age and during this time of the trends of history brings revival either here or somewhere else in the world. Now the four great judgments of history are as follows. At the second advent, that is not the resurrection. Advent is when the Lord touches his feet on the ground. The, res the rapture, resurrection, ex anastasis, exit resurrection, he is in the air, and we meet the Lord in the air to be with the Lord forever. So all of these judgments occur after we are resurrected, and the tribulation too occurs after we are resurrected. Furthermore, for all the people who get all hopped up on prophecy during times of disaster, as is happening now, that was part of the article I was going to read you, but it's nothing new. Every time there's disaster in the world, everyone is looking for the rapture or thinking they're in some part of the tribulation. We will take no part in the tribulation where the church age, completely separated out from the tribulation, and by any standard of common sense, since the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be peaceful, then it would seem there would be peace right up until that point. So what we're dealing with is not the tribulation, but the trends of history and the fact that believers have failed. It might be 1,000 years before the resurrection of the church. It might be tonight. We don't know. And of course they point to the king of the north, Russia, moving its ship southward. The king of the west, they call the United States, moving its ships to the uh, east. As far as the king of the uh, east is concerned, they've made no movement yet. The king of the south, they pontificate, could be Egypt or some pan-Arabic bloc as the Arabs get together. But all of that has happened before in history. We've had all that bluster ever since we've had the great bear of the Soviet Union and the eagle of the United States battling each other. But we can't get involved in the doctrinal fad of prophecy because history is on a downward trend. History's on a downward trend for no other reason then believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have failed miserably when it comes to their unique spiritual life. Ninety percent of believers can't even give the gospel straight, which is sad. Ninety-nine percent of believers, probably, don't even know how to rebound or utilize 1 John 1, 9 in its protocol form. So the four great judgments in history, one occurs after the tribulation in which the Lord will come down, defeat the enemies of Israel, and send all unbelievers on the earth to Hades. That's the first great judgment. And then there's a restoration of values because the millennium begins with all believers, believers only, and those winners in the church age will rule during the millennium. So there's a return to values during the millennium. As time goes on for a thousand years, there's a degeneration from those values. And a third of the earth will not believe in Christ, even though he's present on the earth, just as a third of the angels though present with Jesus Christ, decided to rebel against Christ. A third of mankind, though with Christ, will rebel against Christ. Thus showing Satan, it's all about volition. 
It's not about environment because the environment of the human being is far less satisfactory than the environment of the angels. Furthermore, we're a lower creation, not as smart, yet smart enough to be able to make choices for or against Christ. That's the first great judgment, the second advent. The second great judgment occurs after the Gog revolution, and that is when, again, all unbelievers will be sent to Hades. That leaves nothing but believers and the Word of God and everything of value, true value. Then we have the third judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, in which unbelievers will be resurrected from Hades and they will face the last judgment and be cast into the lake of fire. That's the last judgment for them. The fourth judgment will be the destruction of the earth and the entire universe found in 2 Peter chapter 3. So those are the four great judgments of history. And what survives all of those judgments? Things of value. The word of God which abides forever. Believers who will abide forever. Both winner and loser believer because of grace. So everything that has eternal value will survive the greatest, speaking of nuclear explosions, the greatest nuclear explosion of all history in which the entirety of the universe its expanse is even unknown to us will blow up but our resurrection bodies will survive it all and we'll get to see it and throw a big party now personal impact is what we deal with during these times of the trends of history Personal impact is defined as blessing to others by association, often without their cognizance. Blessing by association with the invisible hero includes the following peripheries. Number one, blessing by association to family. That includes husband, wife, mother, father, children, relatives, and yes, even pets, for even the beast of the righteous shall be prospered. Number two, organizations, businesses, schools, teams, law firms, medical clinics, military organizations, law enforcement, engineering firms, banks, corporations, symphony orchestras, and any other legitimate organization. Number three, those in your social circle, those who are involved in your social life will be blessed. Number four, church life, including the mission board, prep school, any type of Christian service organization in which you are involved will be blessed. Number five, there's geographical blessing. This is all invisible, and we studied in the last hour why it is. It's because for three hours, our Lord endured the cross in invisibility and utilized the unique spiritual life to handle the cross. So we too utilize the unique spiritual life in invisibility. So that's why we are invisible heroes, while in the Old Testament it was reserved to visible heroes, such as Moses, Joshua, David, Elijah, Elisha, and so on, Hosea, etc. So there is geographical blessing by association. You can consider this as your cup overflowing to others. Geographical includes your neighborhood is blessed, your city is blessed, the county in which you live, the state in which you live, and the nation in which you live, the United States. Historical impact is defined as blessing by association to the Gentile client nation through the formation of the pivot of mature believers. The client nation to God has certain distinct characteristics, such as freedom. 
that includes equal rights before the law, freedom to evangelize a large number of believers, freedom to evangelize, comma, a large number of believers existing in the nation, a portion of those believers who have executed the spiritual life of the church age and become part of the pivot of mature believers, and from these invisible heroes come evangelists, pastor teachers, and missionaries who extend the spiritual life of that nation beyond its own borders. In the church age, we have the times of the Gentiles, as we've studied in Luke 21:24, in which only Gentile nations can function as client nations to God. Romans 11:25 we also went over, in which it states, the fullness of the Gentiles, which is refer referencing the invisible heroes of the church age reigning with Christ in the millennium. So, principle one, through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. What's that? Maybe you've never heard it before. I explain it in essentials, but just uh, for your sake, post means after. Salvation, self-explanatory. After salvation, the word you might have a problem with is epistemological. That simply means you are learning the musterion or mystery doctrines of the church age, epistemological, and rehabilitation, we all know what that means. We rehab ourselves from our former way of life. So through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, the believer executes the protocol plan of God and advances to spiritual maturity. He then becomes an invisible hero and a member of the pivot to the client nation. The size, in principle two, the size of the pivot of invisible heroes and the number of those who reach play Roma to Theu, that determines the blessing or cursing of that nation and the history of that nation. Play Roma to Theu simply means receiving all the fullness of blessing from God that blessing overflows to the client nation and thus becomes a blessing by association. Number three, a large pivot of invisible heroes means national blessing and prosperity in spiritual affairs as well as in the function of government, law enforcement, military modus operandi, the economy, and the cultural and social life of the nation. We can see now that the influence is too small, for our cultural life is terrible, our social life is terrible, government is functioning outside of its bounds, and law enforcement as a result of following orders will too operate outside of its bounds. So when the pivot of invisible heroes and believers in Pleroma status become too small in a client nation, too small to have any impact, this brings about the administration of the five cycles of discipline to the client nation, of which we are now in the third cycle of discipline, economic disaster. The cycles of discipline are mentioned in Leviticus 26, 14 through 38. Turn in your Bibles to Leviticus 26, 14. The cycles of discipline are, all mo are all also mentioned in Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 67, though in a different manner. So Leviticus 26, 14. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, of course this is written during the time of Israel as a covenant nation, as the client nation, of the Old Testament because it was the time of Israel. Now it's the time of the Gentiles. This does apply to the church age, to the client nation in the church age, due to the fact that this is the times of the Gentiles. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, today it would be the believer not carrying out the commands of the protocol spiritual life. In those days it had to do with following the commands of the Mosaic Law and also a remnant of believers utilizing the faith rest drill. And if you reject my decrees 
and abhor my laws, the laws of divine establishment, and fail to carry out all my commands, and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror. That has already occurred in this country. And uh, it goes on to pretty much sum up all the cycles of discipline right here. I will set up my face against you, or excuse me, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it, economic disaster. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies, fourth cycle of discipline. Those who hate you will rule over you, fourth cycle of discipline. And you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. Verse 18. If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Once you go through the first cycle of discipline, of social decay, and the sudden shock of terror, there will be a punishment seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. This is indicating the coming third cycle of discipline. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit. Third cycle of discipline. The first and second cycles of discipline deal with the sudden terror that is then multiplied in the second cycle seven times and also includes a cultural collapse in the area of marriage especially family, and government. If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength, strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit under an agricultural economy. This means devastation to the economy. Under an industrialized economy such as ours, the loss of industry means the same thing. 21. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals. This includes criminal elements from within and also criminal elements from without that have infiltrated the country through, you know, terrorism, infiltrated the country through a lack of military vigilance. And what they will do, they will rob you of your children. It is said that Phoenix, Arizona is the kidnapping capital of the world. They will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, both criminality and terrorism, eventually, when strong enough, destroys the economy, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. In fact, you'll be too scared to go outside. One of the things I noticed when I went down south, the roads seemed deserted. Why? Nobody could afford gas. You see, we have to take what we're learning and put it into modern times and we have to understand that in ancient times these things related to crops and so on have to do with economy. Verse 23, if in spite of these things you do not accept my correction but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. Fourth cycle of discipline. When you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you. All this is part of the fourth cycle of discipline. Plagues. A lot of those plagues in modern time could be started by chemical and biological warfare. 
I will send a plague among you, such as smallpox, and you will be given into enemy hands. During the Middle Ages, the Great Plague came from a rat, and they called that uh, well, the Black Plague. Uh, in many cases, half in a lot of areas of Europe, they lost half the people, which means uh, here's three people here, one and a half of us would die. <laughs> and four people here, two of you die. But all over Europe, it was calculated, and it might be low, an estimate of a third of all the people were wiped out by plague. When I cut off your supply of bread, this is still four cycle of discipline. Ten women will be able to break, bake your bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight. All of this will be rationing. Don't think we're not too far away from that. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. This is the fourth cycle of discipline. It includes the intensification of the first cycle of discipline. There's an increase in terrorism. The second cycle of discipline, there's an increase in the cultural degeneration. And we'll see the maximum cultural degeneration under the fifth cycle by cannibalism. But there is the second which is more cultural degeneration, and an intensification of the third cycle of discipline. You can see that by the fact ten women are baking one little piece of bread that has to be given out by weight or through the function of what they did in World War II, rationing. And then, of course, under the fourth cycle of discipline is foreign rule, They've already fallen under the sword. They've not yet been taken into slavery or completely destroyed. Verse 27 and following describes the fifth cycle of discipline. So when I speak of the things that happen, and I don't even speak of them in horrid terms, you can see that the Bible puts it very plainly. If in spite of this you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger and anthropopathism, God is never angry. He's doing so as a part of policy. If he did not do so, he would cease being God because he is righteous and just. What the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God will execute, and therefore his anger is simply a way for us to understand his disapproval and the fact that Israel is not following the policy. Then in my anger I will be hostile toward you. You've been hostile, hostile toward me, I'll be hostile toward you. People understand that. And I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. That shows an intensification of the first and second cycles of discipline. You've become so culturally corrupt, you're eating your own children. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries. And I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. What's going to happen in the fifth cycle is everyone's going to nod to God. They're all going to run to church, as it were. But it's too late. Their hearts are too hardened. The churches they run to have no doctrine to teach. And it's over. And the same will happen here. Why? If everybody, during, look, after 9-11, where I worked, every one of them, with few exceptions, ran to church. When they got there, church didn't have anything to say. Oh, they prayed. 
The prayers weren't heard because they didn't understand rebound. And the same as today, they barely understood the gospel, if at all. Everybody ran to church, but there were no answers. There was an answer at one church that I know of. Baraka Church. The answer was, Where have you been? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people didn't like that. But it's true. So I will destroy your high places. That has to do with their idolatry. Don't think that we in modern times don't have idolatry. Your idol is whatever you place in importance above the word of God. Would you rather be watching a television show? TV's your idol. Would you rather be playing the PlayStation, your video game? A video game's your idol. It'll all be taken away from you. Facebook? Oh my goodness. Did life even exist before Facebook? MySpace. MySpace. Another idol. No, you can enjoy these things. I'm, I'm not being aesthetic, and I'm not telling you not to enjoy your life and to enjoy all the great technologies that we have. Enjoy them, but don't make them your idol. Don't get weird. There's always those weirdos who say, I'm giving up all of this fun because it's an idol. No, idols are in your mental attitude. Your idol could be yourself if you're a self-righteous legalist type. You worship yourself. You are great. And in Bible says you worship your own emotions. Your emotion is your idol. So have your televisions. In fact, get the biggest one you can afford if that's what you like. Make it HD. Have surround sound. Enjoy life. God wants us to. But all these things, if you make them your God and suddenly they're gone, doesn't that make you miserable? If you're addicted to Facebook and suddenly it's gone, there's going to be people wandering around not knowing what to do. That's because they made it their God instead of making the Word of God number one priority in your life. When you make the Word of God number one priority in your life, then you can enjoy all these things that we have in this country. You can enjoy the good food. You can enjoy food from all over the world in this country. You can enjoy the best entertainment ever made in all of human history. So many movies, we couldn't watch them all in a lifetime. Good movies. A lot of them are bad. but. Even all the good movies that have been made, we couldn't watch them all in a lifetime. All the video games, if you were to complete each one, it probably would take you a lifetime. Starting with Atari all the way up through play, PlayStation 3. And when people get tired of that, they're going to have a PlayStation 4. But that will be, all be torn down under the concept of the fifth cycle of discipline. Why? Because of their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me. Unfaithfulness toward the word of God. Which made me hostile toward them. So that I sent them into the land of their enemies. I think I missed part of it. I jumped ahead. Let's go back. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless, lifeless forms of your idols. You'll be playing your PlayStation and flop over on it, dead of some chemical or biological or nuclear attack. Cut down your incense altars and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor, abhor you. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries, places of worship, and I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. You're running back to church, but it's too late. There's no message to be given. Verse 32, I myself will lay waste the land, 
so that your enemies who live there, that is, those who live there under the administration of the fourth cycle of discipline, now seeing the fifth, will be appalled. The devastation will be so great that even the enemy that abhors you will be appalled at all the devastation. Let's skip now to verse 40 because the other verses deal specifically with Israel and the Sabbaths. Remember that. We studied that. Verse 40. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, what does that mean? It simply means that the people recognize the four-generation curse. And the fact that under the four-generation curse, the first generation went from doctrine, away from doctrine, then the second intensified that, the third intensified that more, and the fourth generation was failing completely until now. Now they've had a change of mind, so they're confessing their sins. The sins of their ancestors, of course, many of them would be dead. It doesn't really mean that. It simply means that they are recognizing the principle of the four-generation curse. The very fact that they're confessing their own sins means that they acknowledge that their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers had failed in the same way. That's all that means. For they operated in opposition to God. For they were unfaithful and hostile toward God, and they will recognize that. That's what it means. 41, which made me hostile toward them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, when they pay for their sin, that is, uh, the judgment causes a turnaround in thinking. And judgment on this country may cause a turnaround in thinking, or we could be just going out under the fifth cycle of discipline. I have my own opinion, but I'm not a prophet, so I'm not going to give it. Truth is, I don't know what's going to happen. I only take solace in the fact Jesus Christ controls history. Verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. That's dealing with Israel. They will be restored, uh, and they will again be restored in the millennium. Client nations in the church age, once they go out of the, under the fifth cycle of discipline, it moves to another area. That nation is done. If this nation falls under the fifth cycle, there will be no United States of America ever again, ever. That's why we need to turn to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14 2 Chronicles 7.14 I see this verse in a lot of places. Uh, they have one church that has this, or I don't even know if it's a church. It's right before the railroad tracks. Probably is a church behind there somewhere. As you're going from Walmart and you head straight down the road without turning as if you're going to the casino, this sign will be up there with this verse. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people referencing a client nation to God, who are called by my name, same thing, will humble themselves. The first act of humility in the Christian way of life is to stop justifying your sin, to stop deceiving yourself about your sin, and to stop being self-absorbed. So what's the first act of humility in the Christian way of life? Name your sin to God. Admit it and to God only. And that admittance to God means you've humbled yourself. That's what you do when you pray. Humble yourselves and pray. They've rebounded. And seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. They have sought Bible doctrine. That's tantamount to the idiom, seek my face. They're seeking now Bible doctrine. And they've turned from their wicked ways 
That includes the wrongdoing of socialism. They've returned back to divine establishment principles and they've stopped their wicked ways of operating off of some other system than what God has provided. Then I will hear from heaven why they've rebounded. Once you name your sins to God, then your prayers are heard. If you are not in fellowship, your prayers go no higher than the top of your head. And they bounce around in your brain, in your flesh, because that's what you're operating under, your flesh. And I will forgive their sin. Why? God is faithful and just to always forgive our sins, no matter how many times we've committed it. And we'll hear their land. That's the only hope for these United States of America is for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to realize that all the dog and pony show is silliness, to realize that they've been arrogant, to realize that to operate under the emotional revolt of the soul and to run up and down an aisle and to shout hallelujah and praise God is not the spiritual life, but a form of godliness or the spiritual life that denies the true power of the spiritual life. Some of the hardest people to reach are the holy rollers because they worship their emotion. But perhaps when under such pain and strain, they'll look for something with a little more meaning because running up and down the aisle won't keep us from going under the fifth cycle. It won't keep Charleston from being nuked. So a large pivot of invisible heroes, mature believers along with those who have reached Pleroma to Theu means the five cycles of discipline are canceled and the nation is delivered by the grace of God. Now since our nation is still alive, though we're hanging by a thread, we have the gracious opportunity today to once again evangelize for me to teach Bible doctrine, for you to learn it, so that a new generation of believers might deliver this nation. For as goes the play Roma believer, so goes the client nation to God historically, spiritually, economically, culturally, and socially. All that have been mentioned in the previous verses just noted. When the priv pivot shrinks through apostasy, the client nation declines, and we are in decline, rapid decline. It is eventually destroyed by the administration of these five cycles of discipline. International impact is defined as blessing by association to a non-client nation through missionaries who have attained spiritual maturity. Missionaries who have international impact are those believers who are consistent in the cognition of Bible doctrine under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit from their right pastor. A missionary, just because he's a missionary, does not make him a mature believer. A missionary must do the same as all other believers and function under the ministry of their right pastor to grow in grace and in the knowledge of their Lord and Savior so that whatever work they're doing doesn't become the main focus. It, can't never, it can never be the main focus. Otherwise, they'll lose out on their spiritual life. Their spiritual life must be the main focus. Everything else will fall into place. But such a missionary that understands that, a missionary who's an invisible impact, a missionary will have a dual blessing. It'll bless the client nation he comes from and bless the nations he goes to. So the mature uh, missionary is a blessing to the client nation for which he comes, or from which he comes. The mature missionary is a blessing to the foreign country to which he goes. So when the invisible hero goes to a foreign country as a missionary, he becomes a source of blessing by association to that non-client nation, so that that nation will prosper. The mature missionary does not interfere with the politics, the culture, or the function of the non-client nation through Christian activism, which is both evil and a part of moral degeneration. That's where many legalistic missionaries have failed. They go in and try to clothe the chief 
They don't wear clothes. It's part of their culture. It doesn't matter if they wear clothes or not. Covering themselves won't give them salvation. Faith alone in Christ alone will give them salvation. If they wish to change their culture on their own, that's their culture's business. So true. So what should the missionary do? Because the impact is both invisible and spiritual. They must have an indigenous policy, which has three principles in it. It's very simple. Number one, they go in and evangelize the foreign country or the area that they're in in the foreign country. Number two, they teach Bible doctrine to the converts. Number three, they establish local churches by spotting the spiritual gifts in that area. They might notice someone has the gift of pastor teacher. So they begin to set up the local church and put into place a pastor teacher that knows their culture, knows their language, knows everything about how to communicate in a far better fashion than an Anglo-Saxon would in India, for example, or in China, or in Africa. We will continue our study concerning this impact tomorrow. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.